Okay, I think we are live, everybody. We are super excited to be here today, and we have a great program ahead of us today. I have Raya. You can see her in the sign that will be joining us. And Raya, do you want to take it away? Absolutely. So hello, everybody. I am so excited to be out here today. And the snow is pretty much melted away, but uh, wasn't that a beautiful scene to wake up to this morning? Um, so let's get into this. So my name is Raya, and I am a teacher with Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. Maybe you can see my logo there. Um, at the Conservation Authority, you can imagine that conservation is really front and center in, in, of what we do. So conserving um, the natural world, the environment, water, clean air, soil, all these important things, plants, animals, right? And uh, we also have Will here today. So Will, maybe you can say hello. Hello again, everybody. <laughs> and we've got a few people backstage as well. Now, all of us, we're actually watershed on wheels staff. We have these programs where we usually would go into schools and do nature programming with students. Um, since we can't do that right now, one of the things we're doing is moving into these live streams to reach you virtually. Now, um, a couple of things to let you know. If you were interested in a worksheet for that goes with this live stream, well, you can show the image of the worksheet there, then there'll be a link in the chat so you can um, find that worksheet request form and just sign up for it and you'll get access to that. If you have any questions or comments during the live stream, of course, keep them relevant to what we're talking about, right? But uh, absolutely, you can post those in the chat. We'll take some questions at the end. We're aiming for about half an hour plus some question time, but I might go a little over today because there's so much I want to share with you. And finally, um, I noticed with some teachers that we're requesting worksheets this time around that they were you were requesting some for other sessions too. So if you want to know where to find all of the past live streams that we have been doing, um, there'll be a link in the chat for um, where they're all listed on YouTube in one place. So now that we've covered some of those kinds of logistic things, let's get right into what we're talking about today. We are talking about the tiny, amazing, wonderful details of nature, the minutia. Minutia is basically a fancy word for details, but I love it. So those minute things in nature, we're going to be focusing mostly on lichen, but we'll also branch out to some other things as well. So when we think about what is lichen? Well, when we let's consider different living things. A rabbit is a rabbit, a tree is a tree, a bird is a bird, but lichen, that's actually two living things come together to make a new one. So um, let's back up a little bit as to what these two things might be. You might have heard about fungus, right? So fungus is well, things like mushrooms, molds, and yeast, things like that, those are all types of fungus. Uh, maybe you've heard of algae. The singular for algae is alga, <laughs> A-L-G-A. And algae are really simple plants. Uh, they don't even produce flowers. They don't have roots. They are usually aquatic. So living in like lakes or ponds, if anybody happens to have a little pool in the backyard, which I certainly don't, but um, you can get algae growing in those places. What algae can do is photosynthesize. So it takes the sun's energy and produce food, like make nutrients with that. Things like seaweed, that's an example of algae as well. And then cyan cyanobacteria is something else to be aware of. And that's just like a type of bacteria that can also photosynthesize. So fungus, algae, cyanobacteria. What lichen is, is a combination. It's when fungus and algae or and or cyanobacteria come together to make a new organism. And it's kind of like a sandwich. I wonder if I can put my phone down to show this. I'm not sure if I can. I need two hands to show the sandwich. So imagine you've got one hand below. You can do this for yourself if you like. You've got one hand below. That's your fungus um, part of the lichen. And it's like something that the lichen, uh, it provides an anchor for the lichen. And then your other hand can go on top of your first hand and mesh in there a little bit. That's like the algae layer. And actually there is a thin layer on top of that. If you had a third hand, which would be just a thin layer of fungus on top of the algae again. Um, so you've got like a algae sandwich where fungus is the bread. <laughs> Sounds delicious, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, so lichen is a combination of fungus and algae or an alga um, and could be cyanobacteria as well or instead of. Now, 
I think we should go on a bit of a walkabout here. I'm in a suburban backyard, so I'm just north of the GTA. And a lot of the lichen I'll be showing you today out here are ones that you could also find in Toronto or in areas right around Toronto. So I'm going to turn my camera around here and we'll go for a bit of a walkabout and see what kind of lichen we can find. What is Raya talking about when she's talking about these tiny details of nature? We've got a maple tree right here. And if I come around to the other side of this maple tree, dun, da, 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 we can see some color on the bark. So bark isn't necessarily this brown or gray. We've got other colors on them as well. And that's actually the lichen, I wanna make sure it's in focus here, growing on the bark. So this one is called a sunburst lichen. That's the name of it, sunburst, super cool. And you can kind of see, I'll see if I can get a bit closer to it without losing focus. So we can kind of see that it's, if we were to look closely, it's a little bit leafy, like little teeny, teeny, tiny leaves. There are, when we're thinking about lichen, there are three basic categories of lichen. So if you started to get into like the identification of different lichens, the first thing you do is say, is it one of these three? And because this one's kind of leafy, the category for that is folios. So this is a folios lichen. And the description I like to think about, it's kind of leafy. And we'll look at some other ones. Maybe that leafiness will come, uh, will make more sense when we look at some other ones here. Let's see. So this one is another, this might be a rosette type of lichen. And you can kind of see that it's, it's attached to the bark, like on top here as well, but it's separated a little bit. Like the leaves are kind of not attached all the way. And you'll see the difference between folios and some of the other types in a moment. So let's move around here. We're going to look at lichen really up close afterwards as well to show what I mean by leafy. Here you can see it a little bit better. If it goes in focus, there we go. So we can see that there, it's almost like there are a little, come on, focus. You can do it. Okay, that one doesn't want to go in focus, so maybe we'll move on. But you can see that there are little, almost teeny tiny leaf, leaf looking things coming off of that lichen or as part of that lichen. Let's go to this other tree over here and see what we can spot. Dun, da, da, da. Oh, we've got some snow on the goldenrod there. Excellent. And there was one I wanted to show you, and now I'm trying to remember what part of the tree it was on. Well, we can see in any case that we do have some more lichen here on this tree. So usually you'd pass right by these little organisms. And today we're learning that, hey, this is a living organism that actually plays a role in local ecosystems. Here's the one I was looking for. So this one is quite leafy, we can now see. It's almost like lettuce looking, like lettuce on the trunk. Wonderful. Let's keep exploring here because we talked about the leafy lichen, the folios lichen. Oh, we've got some birds that uh, are checking out this yard here. A couple of morning doves. And on this tree at the base of it, there is something that you might even say, Raya, what are you talking about? That's not lichen. Somebody just spray painted the tree trunk. Well, that's what this one looks like. So this is a lichen that it almost just looks like it's part of the bark that is discolored. It's a different, different color. And if the last one was folios, well, this one, I don't see anything that makes me think, oh, it's leafy. This one looks kind of crusty, like it's crusted on here. So the name of this type of lichen is crustose. So if you have the worksheet, you can actually be like, oh, that's the other one she was saying, crustose lichen. So it's kind of crusty, like somebody spray painted it on. And this one, I believe, is called maple dust. Really cool name some of these lichens have. So if you're in Toronto, you're walking around and you see this on a tree, or maybe you see it on a rock, then or something like it on a rock, then you can say, aha, that is maple dust. Raya said so. Kind of gray with a little white boundary. We can see on these rocks that there is also lichen that grows on rocks. So they can grow on trees, rocks, soil. Lichen can grow on all kinds of different substrates, on all kinds of different things. And this organism plays a really important role, like I said, in local ecosystems. Because we're talking about minutia, 
Let's have a quick look at some of these other amazing plants that are growing here. Love this one. Do you know what this one is? What is this plant, do you think? This is a fern before it starts leafing out fully. So these will get to be quite large, these lovely small ferns. And if we look at this rock here, what do we have at the base of it? Sometimes people confuse. Um, they think that lichen is actually this stuff. This is moss. And so lichen and moss, they are different. Lichen is two organisms that have come together to make a new one. And moss is like a simple plant kind of thing. They don't flower um, and they, they're just like one organism there. We can even see some little parts of the moss as it's reproducing. I don't know if you can tell those little tiny stem looking parts there. So really cool, tiny little details in nature. Now I put aside a few more lichen to show you, and I'm gonna ask you if you can tell me if these are prestos or folios. So let's see how close we can get here. This one, what do you think? Does that look like it's spray painted on like a crustose lichen would be? Or does that look like it's kind of almost got little tiny leaves? Is that one folios? What kind of lichen is that? Now this is one, we're going to go inside in a little while and look at some lichen under a microscope. And so we're gonna look at this one under a microscope, whoops, um, and have a closer look at what these look like up close because it's a whole other world, my friends. This one is folios for those that said folios. Yes, so it's kind of leafy, right? It's not crusted on there. What else do we have here? This one, I believe. So this here with the small black pits almost, we'll see that better under the microscope, is called star rosette. If I have my lichen terminology correct. This one here, it's this bursting forth. This one is called sunburst. Starburst? Will, can you correct me? Is it sunburst or starburst? It is sunburst. Sunburst lichen. Thank you, Will. All right. And if we notice, I tend to get my names mixed up a bit. There's one right here that's a little bit different. Gosh, it looks the same color on the screen, but it's actually a bit more of a, a lime green color. And um, that one is candle flame. So as you start to get into learning about lichens, there's some really cool, like I said, some really cool names to get to know as well. And how about this one? Does it look, it's hard to tell because it's on a piece of bark. So the bark is really bumpy. Would you say that that is leafy or crusty? Does it look like it's spray painted on like crustose would be? Or does it look like it's branching out in leaves like a folios lichen would be? Like I said, it's hard to tell because the bark is bumpy, but this one is crustose, so that's spray painted on. So as you start exploring lichen in your world, then you can figure out, aha, is it leafy or is it crusty? Now, ladies and gentlemen, oops, see if I can turn my screen around again. Sometimes I'm holding a lot of things with one hand and uh, it gets tricky. I, a few weeks ago in early April, I was out of the city. I was a bit north of the city. And I made a little film to show you of some of the lichen that was in the area that I was in. So I'd really love to share that with you. And maybe, Will, you can roll the tape. Hi. So as you can tell, I'm not in a city right now. I am in, well, in a forest. And I am about two and a half hours or so north of Toronto. So up in the Muskoka area. I wanted to share with you what kind of lichen we can find here. So let's get right down close to the ground. And if we check this one out, it kind of looks like little tiny reindeer antlers. So you can see it's growing beautifully amongst this lovely green moss. And this one is actually called reindeer lichen. I've got my handy lichen book. It's one I do not see in Toronto. Let's have another look at some other types here. So this one, oh, I wonder if I can zoom in on this. Let's have a close look here. This one actually looks like it's little teeny tiny cups. I can put my stick right in there, <laughs> but it's very, very small. And it almost looks like there's a bit of a powdery substance 
um, on those cups. Sorry for the shakiness. It's hard when I'm zoomed in. And there's another one nearby that looks kind of similar. There it is. So similar kind of a cup shape. Might be a different type of lichen though. I'm going to zoom out. We'll go over to the book and see if we can figure out what these are. Maybe we were looking at trumpet lichen. Or maybe there was enough powder there to say that this one was mealy pixie cup. Although we did look at two. Uh, let's keep scanning here. So we can get into all kinds of details to really identify what they are. But the point here is that there's some more reindeer lichen. That we don't see these ones in Toronto so much. Wow, that's really bright. Oh my gosh. Okay, this is cool. I don't think I've ever seen a lichen that has these red tips. I don't think I've seen a lichen with red on it in Toronto. So it looks like this one is on a stalk and then there's red at the end. And if we come over to the handy book, see if we can spot this one. We've got red on the stalk. Yep. Scarlet pin lichen. That's what it looks like. Cool. Okay. Let's just have a little bit of a scan and see if there's anything that we might spot in the city here. Most of these look like, oh, that's cool. It's like a ladder almost. They're all, it's like cup, a cup growing out of a cup. That's very cool. Um, so think to yourself, have you ever seen these before? I feel like you would have noticed some of them, right? These are lichens that we do not come across in our urban spaces where cars are driving. Look at this one, super cool and where there's pollution in the air. There's a lot less pollution up here. And we can see that the branches are almost dripping with lichen. Thank you so much, other Raya, for sharing all of those lichen. Um, yeah, so there are a lot there that I've never seen in the city of Toronto. And when we think about, gosh, around the world, there are like 17,500 different species of lichen that are known. There's probably a lot more we don't know about yet. Um, we're, we're only seeing a small handful in Toronto. Still really valuable to go exploring in the city to look for lichen, but just being aware that, wow, there's so many different types out there. And uh, when we think about why that might be the case, well, Toronto has a lot of plants and the plants ooh, help us breathe, right? They give us oxygen, um, but there are a lot of pollutants in Toronto as well from the, all, all this human activity, driving around and running machines and things like that. So um, the plants can't necessarily keep up with the pollution to the point where it would keep the air really pristine. And so some of the lichen some of the lichen is thinking to itself, well, <clears throat> if there's even a whiff of sulfur dioxide, I'm out of here. And these lichen that I showed in the other video, um, they were examples of these lichen that are much more sensitive to these types of pollution. So um, I'm not sure if you've heard of the word bioindicator, but a bioindicator is something in nature that we can look at to understand how clean the environment is. So if you were trying to see how clean a lake or a pond might be, you can look at fish or some aquatic insects and things like that to figure out, okay, if I'm seeing this fish, well, then the lake is probably pretty clean. If I'm, if I'm not seeing that fish, maybe it's not so, maybe it's a bit more polluted. Um, when we're thinking about air quality, we can look at what kind of lichen is growing. So we go around, do a lichen walk, identify the lichen. And if there are certain ones that we see, then we can say, well, um, I see this lichen here, so the air quality is probably pretty good, or I'm only seeing certain lichen here, so that means the air quality is not so good. So a bioindicator is a really important kind of idea of looking at nature to understand how healthy that area is. Now, the ones I was showing in the video, those are that third type. So we talked about folios, we talked about crustose. The third type of lichen is um, fruticos. And fruticose means that they've almost got like fruiting bodies. So um, they're kind of bushy and branching out and those sorts of things. I'm gonna show you some things in the microscope that before we um, move on. And one of them, so, okay, fruticose, we talked about that and I mentioned fruticose. Oh, I didn't say this part, that fruticose are 
kind of really sensitive to pollution. So that's why we don't often see them in the city. So I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna show some things in the microscope here just so we have a sense of what these different lichens look like. All right, the first one is actually one we saw outside. I don't know if you can see that, but it's a star rosette. So I'm gonna put it under the scope and we're gonna see this image in just a moment. All right, so up close, <laughs> remember all those little black spots on it? Um, we're actually seeing that underneath the scope and I don't really have a pointer because um, that would just be huge and difficult to show you. So all of these little black pits of the star rosette lichen, they are, they play a role in the lichen's reproduction, which is kind of awesome. And if we come over here, there's another species. Can I move it over? Uh, there we go. This one is beautiful. I think that this one is actually one I picked up from not in Toronto, but I can't remember. It's a little while ago. And this one is called, I believe it's called powdered sunshine lichen. Super cool. Now I have a little spray bottle here and I'm gonna show you what, um, what it looks like. Hopefully this will work when the lichen gets wet. Lichen, as we said, it's a fungus and an alga. So um, the alga, in order for it to grow, it needs sunshine. In order for fungus to grow, it needs moisture. So you have to have sunshine and moisture for lichen to grow. And let's see what happens when I spray this one. Oops, I think I didn't center it there. Check that out, isn't that cool? Oh my goodness. So it's actually reacting to this beautiful, like, what, it's damp. I'm gonna expand. I think we saw most of the movement already happen. There's a little bit more. So cool. So um, let's look at another one under the microscope. Oh, you know what? We've been talking. <laughs> I love looking at it. We've been talking a bit about lichen, but I also wanted to share with you another organism. And we talked about this outside a little bit. Can I get this into focus here? I'm going to show it on the uh, bigger other screen first. So this is a patch of moss. Let's see if it's in focus there. And we often think, okay, this is all one plant. But moss, actually, this is another one of nature's amazing detailed kind of example is nature's minutia. Moss is actually made up of many, many tiny plants. So this right here would be like one plant. And moss under the microscope. I'm going to get that in focus if I can. I think that is pretty, pretty good. And we'll see how moss might react to moisture as well. So, oops. Seeing a little bit of movement as the moss is like, the dry moss is realizing that there's moisture around. So the leaves are like, okay, I'm gonna expand. I'll do one more spritz. Let's see what we can observe here. I think my spritzer is getting dry. Good timing, Raya. <laughs> this is one tech difficulty I haven't had yet on these. It just makes it pop, doesn't it? If you are outside and you have a little spray bottle and it's a dry day and you see some lichen, you can always try this out and see if it changes what it looks like. Maybe it changes the color. Maybe it changes the form a little bit as the lichen or moss is like, okay, it's time to uh, to kind of wake up here. Um, so showing a few things under the microscope. So we've had a closer look at our lichen and at our moss. And um, we were talking about the air pollution piece. And I wanted to share a little bit more about um, some other minutia that we might come across. And wait a second. Raya, Raya, hi, <laughs> sorry. Can I just interrupt for one sec? I found a really cool lichen that I'm so excited to share. And um, I won't take very long, I promise. Okay, go ahead, go ahead, I love Thank you, okay. So I just walked a little bit further and I came across this amazing cliff face and look what was growing on it. So this is a type of rock lichen, growing on rock, makes sense. Kind of looks like crunchy paper. Um, light brown is dry right now when it's wet, it's darker. And look at the back of it. It's like black, it looks like super dark black not really powdery, but that granular kind of look to it. 
And oh my goodness, there is so much of it growing here. So we said it was a, growing on a rock and the name has to do with that. It's actually called rock tripe, smooth rock tripe. There are a few other types as well. So that is super cool. And while I have your attention, I also wanted to share with you another one that is growing next to it. Check this out. It's gnarly. It's bumpy. It's gray. There is lots of it here as well. And when you look at this, what does that remind you of? And I'll ask this a different way. If you think about an animal, um, maybe an amphibian, <laughs> whose skin does this remind you of? Well, somebody back when this lichen was sort of first recognized or discovered in a way, thought it looked a lot like toads or toad skin. So it's called common toad skin lichen. Super cool. And while I have you here, I cannot resist to show you it's not lichen, but this is also super cool. Check out all these ferns growing on the edge of this cliff. It's almost like they're growing out of rock. There's a bit of soil that's gathered there, but in any case, um, ferns are just amazing organisms as well. Amazing, amazing living things. Now, what I love about this one, I want to show you, look at the back. So on the back of these ferns is where these spores are. So many spores in each one of these little bumps. Gosh, I don't know if there's a couple of hundred spores, but so many spores on the back of the fern, and that is how ferns reproduce with these spores. So thank you for letting me share, Raya. Super excited to let everybody know about all of this different type of life that is out here. Thank you so much, Raya, from the past. <laughs> that was definitely worth it. I'm in a slightly windier spot here, so I hope the wind isn't uh, making too much noise. But I couldn't resist showing you um, that lichen is really everywhere. I'm on a street here, just in front of the house I was in the backyard of, and see if we can get this in focus. Look at all the lichen on this tree. So much starburst lichen, so much candle flame lichen. Oh, and I should mention the candle flame, this one here, the kind of lighter orange, that one um, is actually pretty tolerant of pollution. So you might even find a parking lot and find the curbs where people park against and spot, oh, there's some lichen there too, and spot some candle flame on that curb. And um, Will, I wonder if you can share some of those photos, you can make them full screen of lichen in the city. So I stepped outside. Um, oh, not that one, the next one's. <laughs> so I stepped outside um, of my, where I live yesterday, and I took those photos just of the street around me. And you can see that um, in front of a school, there was one photo, let's see if I can see which photos we're looking at. Yep, so that one's in front of a school. And the next one, there was actually a fence. And I was like, I wonder if there's like in there. So at the base of the fence, I looked at the curb or at the concrete part. And next photo, we've got lichen growing on that concrete. So it's, or maybe that's wood. So it's really everywhere if you start looking around. And in this, this is one of those curves and you can see all kinds of lichen there. In the middle, there's even moss growing right where that kind of nail is to keep the curb in place. There is so much to check out in our urban spaces when it comes to this detailed minutia. Now, um, what I encourage you to do is to do an exploration and check out that lichen and think also about how important lichen is. There are, lichen is, plays a vital role in ecosystems. For some animals, it's actually a really important food source, like for caribou, for instance. Um, they rely on some reindeer lichen up north that uh, for their main food source. It grows pretty slowly, so we wanna be mindful of that, um, but do check it out and um, think about how important it can be for different spaces. There was one picture, Will, if you can bring it back up, that I found a couple of years ago, the first time I've ever seen a hummingbird nest. And when I saw it, it was almost invisible. It was so camouflaged. So hummingbirds, they will use spider webbing to make their nest kind of elasticy and like held together but then they'll put lichen on the outside of it often. And that lichen helps to camouflage it and give it that extra protection. So a lot of different uses for different wildlife. Maybe I'll go to a shadier spot. 
but I did want to mention, sorry, I'm, no, I know the wind is probably very difficult to hear me right now. Um, I wanted to mention then, if you are thinking of, okay, I love being outside. I can only go a few blocks right now. I need to stay in my neighborhood. There is a lot to discover in your own neighborhood. You can go outside, check out what different colors of lichen you can find, how many different types, even if you don't know the names, that's okay. Um, if you're interested in learning more about lichen, there was actually a contest to, for people to vote on if Canada was to have a national lichen, what would that lichen be? And maybe we can put in the chat the link for the winning lichen from this big contest that happened about a year, I think it was a year ago actually, just over a year ago, where that was decided. Um, so, and if you can't go outside, just Google lichen and you will find so many cool pictures of different types of lichen around the world that just blow your mind away. And you can check out other organisms too, right? We talked about mosses. We just barely scratched the surface of mosses, but there is so much to discover there as well. At this point, um, if you need to leave, then we're going to take some questions, but if you need to leave, then that's totally fine. And I want to thank you so much for attending today. If you are able to stick around, we'll take a few questions and um, talk about uh, lichen for just a couple of more minutes and maybe other examples of nature's minutia. And Will, if you don't mind, I'm just going to turn my screen off for a moment as mm -hmm. I um, head over to a better, less windy spot. Perfect. Awesome, Raya. Uh, during that time, I'll just uh, be right here. And uh, yeah, we're going to take some questions at this moment. So with your class, you can discuss what questions you might want to ask Raya about maybe lichen uh, or the topic that we've talked about today. There's definitely a lot of things around this, and we want to make sure we can answer some of those questions that you and your students or a member of public may have. So one of our questions, Raya, if you're all good, that we have is right here with us. And we have Rebecca from... I think it's uh, from Larkser Park Public School. What is the difference? And they were, were not able to make the beginning part between uh, lichen, fungus, and moss. They're wondering what the difference is between them. Perfect. So they are all living organisms, for sure. Um, fungus and moss, they are both like single, they're organisms made up of one organism, which maybe doesn't make a lot of sense, except that lichen is made up of two organisms. So lichen is a new living thing, not a new living thing, it's a living thing all on its own, but it's made up of fungus and an alga or a cyanobacteria. So fungus is made up of two other living things to make a new one, whereas fungus and moss are both individual. Now fungus um, has a really unique way that it grows. It can't photosynthesize. It doesn't have chlorophyll. Moss does have chlorophyll. So moss can take the sun's energy and make its own food. And, um, but moss doesn't really have roots the way that other plants do. It's a very, very simple plant. It doesn't have a true stem, doesn't have true leaves. Um, so those are some differences there. And I just love that idea of like fungus and alga coming together to make like a super organism, mm -hmm. which is lichen that can both photosynthesize and has its anchoring that the, that the fungus provides. Yeah, and, and, and I wanted to add on to that, Ryan, and, and thanks for that explanation between the three. Uh, it's such a beautiful relationship that they kind of have. And this word symbiotic or symbiosis really kind of comes from the discovery of lichen itself. It's, you know, different living things working together, you know, and now they're a new living thing. And it's a beautiful thing. And that's why nature and just getting out there and learning about it is something that we are trying to do. And hopefully everybody else is trying to do, you know, even during this time of COVID. Now we have another question, Ryan, that we have. Uh, Julie asked, what colors can lichen be? And I think uh, we can talk about maybe even some of the ones that we've seen throughout this live stream too, right? Yeah, I mean, we've seen like in the city, I see a lot of those starbursts and candle flames. So a lot of kind of oranges, yellows, they tend to jump out at me. There's a lot of grays and blues as well. And outside of the city is where I see more of the red tipped lichens, that kind of thing. Um, those red ones really jump out at me. They're kind of awesome. <laughs> I'm well, have you seen any other colors? Is anything else coming to mind for you? Green, uh, blue, gray, orange, Yeah, a yellow. lot of grays, uh, kind of like a bluey green, if anything. A big thing about lichens is a lot of their color will pop after rain as well. You know, they may seem kind of dim and, you know, not as bright as they really truly are. And that has to do with them. You know, we saw it during Raya's explanation with the microscope. 
that once they kind of put water on, they expand, you know, that's when they're going to start to maybe photosynthesize and those colors really start to shine on them. Even our crustose ones too. And I'll mention the reason for that is that um, in the earlier on, I mentioned how lichen is kind of like a algae sandwich with fungus as the bread. So that really thin layer of fungus on top of the algae, when it gets wet, that's when it gets kind of translucent. So you can see through it to see the algae color. So that's kind of describing why the colors pop when they get wet. Nice. And we have another question here. Rebecca uh, Lane from Larkspur again is asking, does lichen grow quickly enough that the reduction in you know pollution due to the lockdown, can we see this maybe uh, over a year or two? Because I think we we're kind of alluding to there's people less, there's you no know, less commuting. We've seen that in regards to some pollution charts as well, that you know, COVID has helped in some ways in regards to reducing pollution or commuter travel. Yeah, so that's a good question. I don't know that there has been any evidence to show that at this point. Um, there might be a little, like, perhaps there might be more of the same lichen we've seen. If we were looking to have more of the fruticose types of lichens that grow outside the city, in the city space, I think it would take many more years of decreased pollution. So that sulfur dioxide is, there's less of that in the air. They're really sensitive to that particular. Um, and on top of that, the, I can't remember it. Well, some, some lichen reproduced by spores. We didn't talk about spores, which I meant to get into, but there's just so much to talk about. Um, so the spores of that lichen have to actually land somewhere to grow or somebody would have to bring some of it and try to get it started somewhere in Toronto. And then that lichen would either react to the amount of pollution, like that there's less of it, or they would react to if there's more of it and not be able to grow. That was a bit of a roundabout answer. But uh, in short, there hasn't really been studies done yet, I don't believe. Um, there could be some more of the lichen growing that we already have, just expanding further, perhaps. Yeah. And then, and then, pretty slowly, but sometimes sometimes it can grow quick, quickly as well if the conditions are right. It can like, when I say slowly, we're comparing that to plants that we're familiar with, with their growth rate, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for the common lichen itself, it's like one to three millimeters that they grow per year. So it's, you know, and that's, you know, a generalization for lots of the lichen maybe within our area. And that's why you don't see really lichen on some of our younger trees. And you see a lot of lichen on those older ones. Uh, we saw within that image that Raya took right in front of this school, I'll pull it up here again. This tree has probably been there maybe since the, you know, since it's been built and it, all this lichen has had time to grow on it as well. So uh, definitely and I'll add to north, like in the Arctic where the caribou are eating that rain, reindeer lichen, it might be less than a millimeter a year because there's less light um, in some of those seasons than we have here. And so, and the temperatures and stuff. So it grows even slower than it would in Toronto. Definitely. Yeah. So we have another question here. We have one from Robert Bruce and I'm not quite sure about this one, Ryan, maybe you have an idea. And if not, we can maybe just think of something that would happen. And it is what happens to lichen if it's submerged in water? That is such an interesting question because just this weekend, this is a little anec Raya anecdote, um, I was actually hanging out distanced with um, some, uh, there was a couple, there were a couple of kids who, well, truth be told, I've gotten them into lichen. So one of them, he had a little mini lichen collection and he wanted to make, instead of like a glitter or a snow globe, he wanted to make a lichen globe. So he actually put lichen in water in a clear container <laughs> and had a lichen globe, which I thought was so neat. But if you leave it in water like that, then I don't believe, I think it would eventually, it wouldn't take too long before it starts to kind of lose its structure and decompose a little bit. So they need that balance. Um, I don't know for a fact. Will, do you, you said you don't know if, uh, if they survive well in water. I think they need to like, to not totally be drenched all the time, but maybe you can experiment. See if you can collect some lichen um, and uh, experiment by putting it in water and seeing how long it'll last before it changes. It looks like it's less healthy. Yeah, I mean, and one thing too, that's really neat about lichen, and I'm not too sure in regards to this question, Robert, exactly, but you'll find lichen, especially on the trees and the branches, they'll kind of be in the valleys of it. So where if it was to rain, the water would travel down these valleys and lichen is kind of a bit more likely to grow there because that's where they're going to maybe get, you know, the nutrients from the water or water to survive as well. We know all living things need water, right? And lichen is no exception to that too. Of course, too much of everything. If you submerge it for days, months, years, I'm not quite sure what would happen. Maybe some yeah, I think types of survive. Mentioned the algae, we mentioned that algae likes aquatic environments. So the algae would probably be fine. It's the fungus part of the lichen that might, 
be a little bit too wet in that case. Mm -hmm. Nice. And we have another question here uh, from the grade fives at Lakespur Public School. And maybe we can both answer this. It's really up to however we want to approach this, Raya. What got you interested in nature and a career in nature as well? Raya? Oh my goodness. I, yeah, I can absolutely share. Um, Will, do you want to share first? Uh, sure, sure. I can share first if, if you'd like. Perfect. So what got me interested in nature? And I'd always liked going camping with my family. I always liked being outside and it was really good for my mental health. I knew if I stayed inside and played too much video games, I'd be a real big grump. Now, deciding on what I wanted to do with my life, I either wanted to be a computer programmer and design video games, or I wanted to be an outdoor education teacher. And I realized that I have a way more passion or a larger passion and also positivity in regards to my mindset around being outside and learning about it. I also love, you know, talking about different interesting nature facts as well. Like if it's lichen, if it's about, you know, bees itself and really getting people to explore just the small nature things around us. Cause we've forget about it too. You know, lichen is something that we've, you know, especially I haven't known about and it's everywhere around us. And there's so much that we can learn just from this small organism. So what got me into it? Uh, it's really good for my mental health of getting outside and, you know, being positive around it. And I just love learning and teaching. Ryan? Yeah. So in my story, there's a lot of similarities there. I was lucky enough when I was younger that um, I had a lot of opportunities to be outside and I was in, um, it wasn't the regular girl guides. It was a different girl guides type of group. And we did so much outdoor activity and um, really spending that time in nature. So spending time in nature felt very normal and kind of relaxing for me. And it was after, I think it kind of happened in stages a bit that I loved spending time in nature. And then from there, went to loving learning about nature and really valuing it and appreciating everything that the environment offers us. And I will just add to that. I also want to really acknowledge that we are all part of nature too. So, um, like recognizing that I'm a part of this big system out here, right? And how we interact with each other, what I'm breathing out is being breathed in by the plants and vice versa and, um, and all of those pieces. And then, yeah, this, the more I learned, the more I wanted to learn, the more fascinated I became by every little aspect of the environment that I learned more about. And just like Will Lichen, I only started learning about it about four years ago. Before that, I, <laughs> I knew the word and that was it. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And uh, even lichen too, uh, some think, you know, lichen is thousands, thousands of years old in, in some spaces. And they found some on the rock and the crustos, which Raya alluded to on the tree earlier, right? You know, the only way to get that off is really by breaking the substrate or what it's, it's on. And so it's really hard to really damage those ones. And that's why the you know, scientists are looking at how old they are too. And it's uh, pretty amazing. We have another question here. Robert Bruce asks, would lichen grow in all or most ecosystems? My short answer is probably. I think it really would. It's a bit trickier when you've only got, um, like in the in Antarctica or the Arctic, where the fungus might not, um, the fungus part of the lichen might not really have the conditions it needs. So, Maybe not so much in those kinds of extreme cases, but there are a lot of extreme conditions where lichen grows. It's really fantastic. Um, so, yeah, my short answer is like probably, maybe even mostly, yes. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. I was muted there, Ryan. Yeah, it's pretty, you know, thinking about lichen itself, and we mentioned that they're very sensitive to pollution. And also around that, there are some lichen that really like pollution, too. So even if we think about, you know, cities, we're not seeing the ones that Raya had in her video that are beautiful because they're so sensitive or they're so tolerant to uh, or sensitive to pollution itself. But we may see lichen that's more tolerant and says, oh, yeah, you know, give me all that nitrous oxide. Like, I love this. This is great food for me. More Which abundantly in these extremes. Yeah, exactly. So it was pretty, pretty interesting stuff. So um, are there any more questions that we have at this time? I'm trying to see. Um, yes, it's, you know, freezing temperatures don't seem to bother them as much, uh, and can live in, you know, hostile situations, not hostile situations, hostile environments, 
uh, but you know, it may impede their lifespan too. So some and like I said earlier, seven, over 17,000 different species that we know about. So a lot mm -hmm. of variety in their tolerance to different uh, climates. Yeah, and there's uh, we can say there's not a ton of researchers out there that are really specialized in lichen as well. Um, there's one, uh, I'm forgetting the gentleman's name that did our lichen training, Raya. Uh, yes, he actually so came in out. the Ontario Museum of Nature, uh, there's a fellow from McMullen. If you are able to follow any of his work, then you can see some really fantastic photos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He awesome. also wrote that book that I showed in the video from Muskoka. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so it doesn't look like we have any more questions here right now, everybody. Uh, but if there are, we will take some time just to answer them in the chat. Myself uh, and our back end team of Carly and Emma, as they're doing a great job as well, helping out in the back end. So, Riot, do you want to finish us off for our last kind sure. of uh, outro? Yeah, thank you everybody for joining me as we explore the minutia of the natural world, lichen and mosses and things like that. I so strongly encourage you to head outside. Like I said earlier, Find, see what lichen you can find even on your home. If you live in an apartment building, maybe on the building there's lichen growing, depending on how old it is, right? So check it out. You'll see your world in a whole new way and share with others. Share with your parents or grandparents or dog or cat what you've learned today. <laughs> um, get outside and enjoy. In a couple of weeks, May 5th, we have a live stream for your grade three friends. So it's all about soil and we invite you to join in for that one as well. And uh, Get outside. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Happy spring. Thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day.